This was going to be a second video in a two-part video on how to get a lot more storage on a Mac Mini for a much lower price by using an external SSD, rather than quite frankly grossly overpriced SSD upgrade options presented by Apple on the Mac Mini, and also removing that two terabyte limit as well. So in the first video, I did an in-depth performance and firmware test on some popular four terabyte SSDs in a couple of different Thunderbolt 4 enclosures, and I, for a number of reasons, came to the conclusion that the Samsung 990 Pro SSD in the Zyke TB4 enclosure was my choice for use with the Mac Mini. Now the performance was solid, the heat was manageable, and it didn't lead to any throttling, even under really extreme scenarios. And if you want to, you can go check that video if you're interested in the testing I did and the results, and I'll link that below. I'm also going to add links below to the enclosure and the exact drive I chose. Now this video was going to be a focused how-to on using that external drive for all your main needs on the Mac Mini so that you could easily go with the base 256GB SSD, which is the best value option by far, and then you can expand to 2, 4 or even 8 terabytes of storage with far more sensible pricing options. Now that video will come shortly, but in preparation for that video, I did a lot of comparative testing between the external drive and the internal Mac SSD. And what I found was actually pretty shocking. Given this is probably of interest to more than just those who are gonna configure an external SSD, I thought I'd share those findings in this dedicated video, and this is that video. Now, plenty of people have commented on the cost of upgrading that internal disk. And people have also talked about the option of using an external drive as a cost saving, and this is all true. But it turns out that other than the horrific Apple tax you need to pay to upgrade that disk from 256 gigabytes up to something reasonable, it also turns out that that internal disk has terrible performance. So you probably want to use an external drive anyway, just to get the best out of that Mac, which otherwise really has great performance for its price. But you might say, but I've seen tests on Blackmagic which show the disk is actually pretty good. And as you can see here, a Blackmagic test on that 256 gigabyte disk shows that it delivers about 2,150 megabytes per second write performance and 2,800 megabytes per second read performance. And people are reporting better performance on the 512 and one terabyte drives with read performance up near maybe 4,500 megabytes per second. And the NAND layout on the Mac Pro version means that they can perform up to twice as well with reports of 6,500 megabytes per second. But the problem here is that Blackmagic is a small test on a best case scenario for the drive. It tests a relatively small file and it's directed purely at the fastest part of the drive, the SLC cache. It turns out that this SLC cache is small and once it's exhausted, things really go downhill in a big way. So before we get to that testing, I wanna provide some context about SSDs and NVMe drives in particular because it'll mean the testing results are gonna be easier to understand. So to start, let's talk about what influences NVMe performance. So NVMe SSDs usually have, I'd say, four primary consideration when it comes to performance. First of all is bandwidth to the SSD. NVMe interfaces usually have four channels on the PCIe bus, and this is the high speed connectivity you're gonna find on system boards of most computers, and that allows components in the system to communicate. And this includes things like the PCIe slots, NVMe slots, and things like network interfaces. So PCIe is bi-directional, and this means that let's say a thousand megabytes per second channel can carry this in both directions simultaneously. In the past, the interface, the NVMe could be PCIe generation three channels. We have just under about a thousand megabytes per second of bandwidth per channel. This would provide about 3,950 megabytes to the NVMe drive over those four channels. The most common current implementation is PCIe gen four. And this gives you about 1,970 megabytes per channel which gives you in total about 7,900 megabytes per channel total available bandwidth. And then newer higher end boards now start to come with PCIe Gen 5. And this is twice the bandwidth again, enabling actually over 15,000 megabytes per second to an NVMe drive. Now, if I look at the system profiler on the Mac, I can't actually determine the bandwidth available to the internal SSD. For an example, on the external SSD here, I can see that it uses PCI Express protocol, and I can see that it has four Gen 4 lanes assigned. And this gives me that 7,900 megabytes per second bandwidth. The internal SSD uses the Apple Fabric protocol, and the controller is actually on the system on a chip, along with the CPU and the memory, and it's not a regular SSD with a regular controller. But as we will see, I actually don't believe that the bandwidth to the controller 
or from the controller to the SSD itself is going to be the constraint on the Mac Mini. Now the second consideration for SSD speed is the caching mechanism. Standard NVMEs usually either use an onboard DRAM or they use what's called a host memory buffer, which means just that they borrow some system RAM to perform that initial caching. It's, I would say, highly likely that the Mac uses some sort of system memory to perform caching, similar to HMB, as shared memory is the approach Apple take to many things. Then the third thing that affects performance, and probably most importantly, is the SLC cache or single level cell cache. And this is an area on the NVMe itself in NAND memory that's optimized for speed. So SLC stores only one bit of data, a one or a zero in each NAND cell. And this is low wear, it's high performance, but it does have the lowest storage density. And as a result, it's the most expensive way to use NAND. So SLC cache on the SSD, the larger it is, the more data the drive can accept before it starts moving that data onto its primary storage. Usually the NAND is configured to have a portion of it configured to SLC and the majority to its primary storage method. And this allocation can be dynamic and it can change. And this primary storage method is the fourth performance consideration. And this is how the NAND is configured for the majority of its storage capacity. So after SLC came MLC, which is multi-level cell. You won't typically see this in consumer storage. Um, and then high performance consumer SSDs usually use TLC, which is triple level cell. This stores three bits in the same cell, and this provides four times the capacity of SLC, um, and that's because each bit doubles the possible number of values it can contain. But TLC is slower to write to than SLC, and it has less endurance, and this means that the cells actually get worn out more quickly. Now, cost optimized NAND will often be configured to use QLC, and these are quad level cells, and they have the worst performance and the lowest endurance, but they give the best data density, doubling that of the TLC storage. So, SSDs usually have a mix of SLC cache for performance and they have TLC or QLC for the majority of the storage and this is for cost reasons. Different SSDs will have more or less of the SLC cache and some are dynamic and this means the NAND will be reconfiguring the NAND from SLC to TLC or QLC when the SSD gets closer to being full. And this whole setup is one of the primary differences between the performance you're going to get on different SSDs. Okay, now we've got that out of the way. Let's look first at how this plays out on the SSD that I've chosen for my external Thunderbolt enclosure. And to start with, let's run that Blackmagic test on this drive. And we can see that it reports about 3200 megabytes per second for both reads and for writes. Um, and this is the test you're probably most likely to see posted on places like Reddit. The Samsung 990 Pro external SSD I'm using uses four gigabytes of DRAM cache, and it has a TLC cache of around 440 gigabytes. So this cache is actually about twice the size of the entire Mac SSD. Its stated max write performance is 6900 megabytes per second and 7450 megabytes per second for read. It's also a TLC NAND SSD, so once that SLC cache is exhausted, its write performance is going to drop to about 1600 megabytes per second for the remaining of the drive's 4 terabyte capacity. And this is something that Blackmagic doesn't show you. Now bear in mind that the full test represents a continuous set of writes that fill the entire drive. So it's showing really a worst case scenario, but it does show what it takes to exhaust the SLC cache and what happens after this occurs. Looking at the full performance test chart, we can see the full profile of the drive's performance in the external enclosure. And although the NVMe is stated as supporting 6,900 megabytes per second write, we can see that due to the constraints of running the drive in an external Thunderbolt enclosure, the most we get is around 3,350 megabytes per second. And this is limited by both the Thunderbolt 4 protocol, which has a theoretical max of around 4,000 megabytes per second, but also the overhead, and then the limitations in the Thunderbolt chipset in the enclosure. But it is still more than the stated max of the Mac Mini's M4 drive, but less than the theoretical, at least, max of the Mac Mini M4 Pro's internal SSD. Now, read performance is similar, as the primary limitation here, again, is the Thunderbolt 4 interface. But the 3500 megabytes per second or so is consistent for the entire 4 terabytes of the drive, even when this data is read sequentially from end to end. Now, let's look at the real-world performance of the Mac Mini M4 SSD, and this goes beyond just a quick throughput test and test the performance of almost the entire drive. And the reason it's not the entire drive is because the OS is actually still installed on here, and that takes about 25% of the space of the drive. So this performance test of the remaining 75% of the drive, which is around 190 or so gigabytes. 
And what we see is actually pretty shocking. For large file writes, which is basically four gigabytes at a time, written sequentially, the performance very quickly drops to 2200 megabytes per second. And then after just about 16 gigabytes of data, it's down to around 1650 megabytes per second. And this until around 75 gigabytes is written. And at this point, write performance drops to just 200 megabytes per second. So it looks like the drive likely has around 75 gigabytes or around 30% of capacity as SLC cache, and the remaining is significantly slower. And to put this into context, 200 megabytes really is slow for any SSD. This is kind of desktop hard drive performance territory. Mixed file writes, which includes a mixture of files of different sizes, we see exactly the same. And read performance is better, and this is what you'd expect from an SSD. And it maintains around 2,500 megabytes per second across the entire available disk. But this is still 25% slower than that of the external enclosure. Now, instead of graphing based on just disk percentage, let's look at this side by side in terms of total capacity and performance over that disk space. And this graph actually looks pretty stupid, to be honest, because of the disparity of what we're getting with the onboard storage versus the external. And what we see here is that the blue line shows the performance of the external SSD in the enclosure over a full four terabyte write. Each test was repeated 10 times, and the results are actually very consistent. And again, we see the drive start at 2200 megabytes per second, quickly climb to 3350 megabytes per second, and it stays there until about 484 gigabytes are copied. And at this time, the SLC cache is exhausted and the writes to TLC start, dropping performance to 1600 megabytes per second, and then with a slight improvement in the last 20% of the drive to around 1800 megabytes per second. Now the internal drive, by contrast, is tiny, and this is why we have such a small graph here. But again, we can see it rapidly drop to 1600 megabytes per second, and then at 75 gigabytes copied, it collapses to 200 megabytes per second. And this is just one eighth the speed of the external drive. If you don't write large files, you may not actually directly see the worst of this, but the drive performs worse than the external storage at all times. If you do pay the premium for, say, the one terabyte drive, you can probably expect a little better, but still not near the external disk. And you'll also likely get some more SLC or cache with that drive, but again, less than half that of the Samsung and with significantly slower throughput. It's very hard to see how any of the larger drives or even the Pro Series drives, to be honest, would have remarkably high performance once the SLC cache is exhausted. Probably best in the base model, but likely not up to the Samsung at a significant price multiplier. Okay, so let's talk about the conclusions here, but please do like this if it was interesting first, or it gave you new information that would help you make your drive choices easier for your Mac. If you're new to my channel, please also do consider a subscribe. I create a lot of storage and performance related content, and I try and do something a little different to others. So I hope there are things that are interesting here to return for. And my channel is, as you can see, small. So your support really does make a big difference. So thank you. Um, okay, so to the takeaways. First of all, as we know, the onboard SSD options are expensive and don't provide good value for money. I wanted to avoid paying any more than the absolute minimum to Apple for their storage. So using an external disk was a clear choice for me. Secondly, and I think most surprisingly, was that the small internal SSD has horrible performance. Not only are those options very expensive, but they just seem to perform really badly. So with this new information, opting for an external SSD becomes, for me at least, a complete no-brainer. And with this in mind, I don't think it makes sense to pay the price for those internal upgrades. So do consider this carefully if you're tempted, and understand it may look like the simple and convenient choice. And again, I'm going to put links below to the drive and the enclosure I chose, and you can check my previous video with the testing if you're interested and want more background on why I chose those. Some may have concerns about robustness and inconvenience on running an external drive, but for me, the benefits far outweigh this. And that configuration can be done quickly and easily, and there really shouldn't be any issues. And in the next video, I will take you through that process where almost everything is moved to that external drive, so you can take the 256 gigabyte base option and not have any capacity issues. And you're gonna save significant money doing this and you're gonna get better performance for doing it also, especially if you use your Mac for things like video editing, which means you're working with large files. So on that note, thank you for watching ever so much and I look forward to seeing you in the next.